I'm going to open this talk in a bit of a non-traditional sense, given that we have already sort of grounded our feet in a bit of call and response. I'm wondering if I could ask for your help as we barrel down uh, the final stretch. Can I, can I enlist you? All right, I appreciate you. Thank you. The one individual who was like, yes, I'll help you out. <laughs> if you're all right, say yeah. yeah. Okay, you can't worry about how you sound. You just need to kind of like exorcise from down here. <laughs> if you're all right, say yeah. yeah. So much better. If you're all right, say yeah. yeah. Yes, if you're all right, say yeah. yeah. That one, if there's someone next to you not doing that one, like nudge them. That one let out. Say yeah. yeah. And if you're all right, say yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Just because you grew up in a racist home, do you think that makes you at least a little bit racist yourself? I'd like to come out to my mom, sure, but if she's not prepared for that, then I'm not ready for that. I'm actually the only person in my family who doesn't speak Spanish anymore, and that's actually kind of a big deal. These are the voices of some of my high school students in Brooklyn, and I've opened my talk this evening with their stories uh, because those stories and their courage in telling them has the potential to completely change the way we think about education. When I was invited earlier this summer to deliver a TEDx talk here at NJIT, I was delighted and honored, of course. Um, but if I'm being completely honest with you, I was also quite intimidated. And after weeks and weeks and weeks worth of written drafts and rewritten drafts trying to paste together the talk that I thought would change the world and capture my theory of education, uh, I arrived at a familiar conclusion. And that is that my story is enough. And I say that that's a familiar conclusion because it rests at the very core of who I am as an artist and a writer, um, but even more directly, uh, my vision for education. And my story is enough, meaning the litany of experiences that have brought me to this exact spot on this stage this evening the ones that have caused me to throw my hands up in the air in joyous celebration of life, as well as those that have crumpled me to the floor in grief. It is those moments that connect me most to those around me, and it is those experiences that provide the richest, most honest platform for me to develop an engagement of this type. Which brings me to the title of my talk, uh, Returning to the Story, How Writing Can Change the World. When I started teaching in New York City seven years ago, <laughs> that is not actually what I looked like, but um, I did need to make up two or three jobs between college and teaching so that students wouldn't think I was like 12. <laughs> I wanted to teach a creative writing course that asked young people to use their lives as academic subject matter. I wanted to place the voices of canonized writers next to those that were typically left outside the context of the English classroom. So I wanted Willie Perdomo next to Walt Whitman. I wanted Patricia Smith next to E.E. E. Cummings. I wanted Kanye West next to Yeats, Lupe Fiasco next to Lucille Clifton. I wanted to create a course that asked writers and students to take their writing seriously, so I did so the only way I knew how. I built a course that was modeled after uh, an approach that I learned as a high school student that um, a former teacher, Jeff Cass, refers to as the creative writing as archaeology approach, which, simply put, asks young people or students, doesn't necessarily need to be young people, to look closely at their own lives and their own experiences prior to feeling licensed in how we explore and excavate stories outside of ourselves in the world, right? Um, so that was the course I sort of set out to teach. And given the rich backdrop, of course, that is New York City in terms of creativity and the arts, I also wanted to create a live literature component. And we've heard a little bit about that this evening, and I'm, I'm excited by the parallels, which simply asked um, friends and friends of friends and friends of friends of friends, some more reluctant than others, to come through my classroom and kick up dust, what I asked them to do. Um, simply build with young people, create a platform, some more artists, teachers, musicians, actors, um, stage actors, right? And after two years of doing this, after bringing it writer after writer through the course, it was not that um, 
surprising to me how much energy and momentum students were demonstrating towards this part of the course. But after two years of doing this, something happened, which brings us to sort of the crux of, of this story. So students started asking really difficult questions of one another and of the artists that were coming into our shared space and of the work that we were using um, along lines of gender and identity and sexuality and religion, questions and statements like those that you heard open this talk this evening. And that dynamic not only excited me, uh, I thought it was revolutionary. Because classrooms, for all intents and purposes, are not safe spaces. I mean, we'd like to admit otherwise, and of course there are structures and routines that we as teachers can put into place in order to assure that you know, students' voices are validated, but that young people were using their own lives as subject matter and taking the risk to talk about times in their lives related to particular components of their identities in terms of gender and race and sexuality and religion and body size, that was powerful to me. So the following year, with outrageous support from my administration, which I'm always quick to say, um, we created a course that was slightly refined in its vision, and then not only were we asking young people to write about their own lives and to use creative writing as a tool for excavation in terms of social identity, but to use the art that they were creating as a springboard into highly structured dialogue um, around identity, right? And I know at first that sounds a little bit like throwing a firework in a mailbox, asking 15-year-olds to simply start talking about all the isms that sort of for our cultural lexicon. Um, and indeed it was at first, but after many conversations with families uh, about the validity of the work I thought we were doing and why it was important that um, young folks were engaging in these conversations, and after fielding many questions about why a student was coming home with a poem they'd written about homophobia or why they were talking about a conversation maybe they had with a peer um, about something from the vault of family secrets, the results were astounding. And in only two or three short years, my classroom was completely transformed into a more safe, honest, open, empathetic space. And students aptly named this course the Dialogue Arts Project. And excited by that sort of lightning in a bottle dynamic, right? We started to think, well, if we can create this opportunity in my classroom where these kinds of difficult subject matter are entering this space, what's to say that we can't replicate it outside the classroom, right? Because to be very sure, right, it's nice that young people are engaging in conversations about diversity and multiculturalism and things that impact their lives, but these are conversations that adults across the country in, in auditoriums and lecture halls not unlike this one are dying to have access to, right? So what was the possibility of taking it outside of our room? So witnessing that transformation from creative writing as archaeology to the Dialogue Arts Project um, asked us to then spend a couple years traveling around the country providing workshops and facilitated dialogue services to um, professors and young people and teachers and folks of all walks of life, um, specifically using the arts as a tool for dialogue. And it became uh, quite clear that there were three significant tenets that made what we were, were asking from people function. And those were the dialogue arts, or the DAP, what students call it, the DAP approach utilizes the arts to create a shared entry point into dialogue about identity. We emphasize a diverse range of identities, and we prioritize independent stories. So what does that actually mean? Right, back up. We utilize the arts to create a shared entry point, meaning if I were to walk into a room and say, today we're going to talk about homophobia, the answer is very clearly and quickly and rightfully, I'd really rather not. <laughs> um, but when we are able to create a common experience wherein we are looking at a piece of art and we're thinking about our own relationships then to how we've sort of learned sexual identity formation and we're sharing those perhaps, suddenly it's not to cheapen the art, but it is to say that without its presence, there would not be an equal playing field of experience and vocabulary that lets us talk about that thing. So the second thing is that we emphasize a diverse range of identities in everyone. One needn't really look any further than the front page of the news or a talk show to see how we have one-dimensionalized identity politics in this country, right? It's always only about gender or it's always only about race or social class, when in fact that couldn't be further from the truth, right? 
There's a whole litany of identities in terms of ability and body size and nation of origin and language of origin that are constantly competing against one another and churning around inside us um, and competing for precedence depending on you know, where we're at. And the third and final thing, and this really brings me to sort of the, the underscored importance of what I'm saying this evening, is that we prioritize stories over buzzwords. Stories over technical terminology that we often sort of get caught up in and lose ourselves in the face of. Currently in education, we are at a dangerous crossroads. In our genuine efforts to prepare for what is certainly the rapidly changing demographic of young folks in this country, we have become a buzzword culture. And that not only have words like diversity and power and privilege become so overutilized that they no longer mean what they once did, but they afford us a false sense of accomplishment for engaging with them, as though there is something inherently good or morally intact about us using these words in our daily lexicon so that we can feel checked in, while what it's actually doing is enabling us to avoid talking about ourselves, which in the case of education, those are the stories that fuel our investment in this work in the first place. And currently, of course, there are a couple important demographic trends that are worth noting that sort of amplify the importance of returning to the story. By the year 2050, white Americans will be the minority in this country. By 2020, wealth disparity, as hard as it is to believe, will be greater in this country than it is now. And it is not enough any longer to simply memorize terms and concepts and dive into our research. We need to learn each other, and we need to learn ourselves. And interestingly, my sort of evolution in this process around democratizing dialogue, um, democratizing the educational process, really mirrors um, uh, the evolution of TED and TEDx in many very powerful ways, which is why one of the reasons it's extremely powerful to be standing with you all this evening. Um, for an organization which suggests the solution is in us, um, TEDx could not be a better platform for that. In the last uh, month alone, 125 TEDx talks have taken place in over 42 countries. To me, that is really powerful. Because what it is suggesting that, that no longer necessarily do we need to look to textbooks written by people whose experiences could not differ any more from our own for answers and solutions to the problems that our culture faces, right? No longer are we expected to find those answers behind prohibitive paywalls or admissions fees, right? The answers are certainly within ourselves. You may recall at the beginning of this talk that I expressed anxiety around what to say and how to say it in a way that would be worthy enough for the TEDx platform so much so that I stress over that process that I nearly let that debilitate me from bringing the stories from my own life um, into this room. But I'm certainly glad I didn't. I mean, I'm not saying that TED or TEDx and power and privilege are the same thing, though there are <laughs> argument could be made that there are some parallels. I am saying that the process by which I arrived here this evening is not unlike what millions of us feel every day when we are placed in situations where we're expected to know terms and concepts and ideas and instructions and answers, but we don't. And we are at a time where we need to start asking ourselves difficult questions about who we are and why that matters in the context of the solutions we are collectively and independently trying to find. And I'm not suggesting that this work is easy. This work of looking at ourselves alongside of, um, or at least maybe in place of, these buzzwords that pepper our culture daily. In fact, it's work that is so difficult, most of us go an entire lifetime without even realizing it is a work to be done. But if 16-year-olds can do it, and they can, if 16-year-olds can look at each other and themselves and ask the difficult questions about when was the first time you felt alone because of a particular identity? When was the first time someone you loved let you down? 
When was the first time someone you loved loved you and you felt good? When was the first time you felt firmly planted in this part of your identity? When is the time when you witnessed something wrong and interrupted? When is the time when you witnessed something you knew was wrong, but you just stood there? If 15-year-olds can answer these questions and can hold each other accountable to these stories, when I step back and I look at the brilliant brain trust that is in this room of educators, um, I am humbled by the certainty that we can do this work too. Thank you very much. Huh?